very much. Uh, actually, I'm a little bit intimidated until, uh, yeah, since talking after Google, Amazon, and companies like such. Now I'm standing here trying to tell you a little bit about uh, the industry of online gaming and the company I founded a few years ago, Gameforge. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you are actually gaming on or offline, console, mobile, whatever? That's a few. How, how many are gaming online? Still a lot. Um, and this is what we see in the industry. It get, gets mainstream. First, a few words on me. Uh, my name is Klaas, as Marco said. I'm 31 years old, and I am a founder of Gameforge, uh, which is an MMO developer and publisher based in Karlsruhe, Germany. Uh, we founded the company uh, six, six and a half years ago, seven years ago, and uh, today have uh, more than 200 million players worldwide in 54 languages. So we are offering our games on a pretty global scale. Uh, we have more than 600 employees, um, grew rapidly, especially this year since we took over a majority of a uh, public competitor of ours. And this year we are going to do around 200, uh, 120, 125 million euros in revenue and are still growing on a two-digit scale uh, somewhere in the medium. So it's a pretty amazing business and I have a lot of fun being still involved with it. The gaming industry as such is yeah, pretty much the biggest entertainment industry in the world. It's bigger than movies, it's bigger than music. It's uh, around 60.4 billion US dollar in 2009 and it is expected to grow to 70.1. Um, it's pretty hard to get numbers on a global scale, so this is all estimates by, by DFC or strategy analytics. The online gaming sector in the gaming sector is the one that makes uh, VCs stay awake at night. It's the fastest growing one, and it's the one that's going to take up to 24.8 billion in total sales in 2013. So pretty fast growing, and 2013 it will be around 40% of the total gaming revenue in the world. One reason why it is growing that fast is because the whole demographic of gaming changed. In the year 2000, the average gamer was male, uh, 20 to 30, maybe 15 to 30. Um, it was, uh, to put it friendly, uh, maybe socially handicapped. And um, uh, probably, pretty much was single, lived in their mom's, uh, mom's basement, stuff like that. You know all uh, the, the typical uh, pictures you have about the gaming geek. Um, today, the whole thing is totally different. Uh, the average gamer, the pre predominant uh, demographic group of online gamers today is female 30 to 40. Nobody would have guessed that. And the reason for that is be games, online games being accessible. It's very, very easy to play games online. The main thing in the year 2000 was you had your subscription-based MMO, you went into the store, you bought a box, you installed it on your PC, you entered uh, a monthly subscription. So it's a big, big hurdle. You need a sophisticated technology. You need to, to enter into a yeah, long-term relationship to be able to start playing. And this is something that definitely changed. Just imagine the Facebook games. Uh, the change in business models, uh, basically games being everywhere you go and everyone you know playing them. Gaming today is mainstream. Um, depending on the country, uh, it has a penetration of 60 to 90 percent of the population and people are spending a lot of time gaming. A large proportion, especially of the time rate, is online gaming. Um, and one other interesting thing, even on this scale, um, the difference between the male and the female gamers in time spent, in the penetration uh, throughout the whole population in the countries isn't that big. It's close to even, and it's increasing. I talked about the business models a bit. Um, the change in business models is a little bit responsible for, being games, uh, for, for games being as accessible as way. As I said, uh, in the past, or in some parts of the industry until today, you have to pay for 
having or being able to play the game. You buy a box in the store, you pay for the download, or uh, as it is for mobile gaming, you purchase an app on the App Store, on the Android Store, wherever. This changed a little bit with World of Warcraft coming out and changing the whole global game into the subscription area where you uh, do your monetization and your revenue streams over time cards for the game or a subscription, depending on the area, depending on the game. And this is still a huge proportion. But gaming got mainstream when you had to pay only if you wanted to pay. When you wanted to pay if you were really engaged in the game, uh, but you weren't forced to. You could play, you could tell your friends about it, and this is basically the sale of item sales, virtual currency, additional content, premium content. This is, for example, what we do with Matin 2, or what uh, Zynga, as one of many social gaming companies, does with Farmville and other titles that are out and that are actually quite great. Um, this is something that uh, is for mobile gaming as well, I just recently read that just 3% of the apps that you can actually buy in the App Store, uh, mobile games, have in-app purchase of items and other stuff. And these 3% of the apps actually already make more than 30% of the overall revenue of all games in the App Store. So a big sign that the business model of, of free-to-play will change this as well. Here you basically say, just in the, in the sub-segment of the massively multiplayer online games, how the business models add up. So they are not cannibalizing each other. There are players who want still a premium AAA title that uh, had a development budget of several hundred millions, and he is happy to pay 50 bucks for a box. But there are other business models as well, and it's depending on the type of content you are delivering, the type of demographic you are targeting, and in the end, it's just something that scales the overall industry. And then, to come to an end and not take too much of your time, um, I just wanted to put out uh, four basic trends that I am seeing on the market. The inner purchase was something I mentioned before. Um, Basically, a friend of mine, Nicholas, sitting over there with his great uh, blog games brief, uh, wrote just a few days ago, if you are developing an app for the iPhone or the Android that doesn't have in-app purchases, stop wasting your time and money. Because that's basically it. Real cross-platform cross gaming is something that we will see in the near future. I mean, today it's like, okay, you can play your game on the social network, you can play your game on a mobile, in a client, whatever. This is kind of nice, but it's not like you use the specialty of the individual platform. So in social media, it should be about the social interaction. On mobile platforms, it should be about the mobi mobility. And this is something where you can really add features to games and add features to, to content that really add up to a richer experience, to a higher engagement. Real social games, real printed big, because I actually think the social games that are there in social networks use the whole social features not in an optimal way. Today, uh, companies like, like Zynga, Playfish, etc., really specialized in using it for virality, for user acquisition, and for retention. But what they kind of missed out on is creating a richer game experience using the sociograph for engaging the user in a way and developing or, or creating a game experience in a way that never has been there before. You can do that, and uh, it's about time that something does it, somebody does it. And the fourth big trend I'm seeing is the thing, uh, location-based gaming. It's very, very small, and I'm not talking about something like, like a Foursquare here, because actually it sucks from a gaming perspective. Um, but uh, Location-based gaming is something where you can really do a lot of stuff and uh, where we will see big companies emerge in the next year.